Hi. Okay, so welcome to uh, another outside salon. Uh, this year it's kind of intense. It's kind of funny to see people who are already wearing the glasses. <laughs> So I, I, before we start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Sacred Land where uh, the University of Toronto operates. Um, it has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years, as you know. And this land is the territory of the Yurong-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas and the, of the Credit River. Uh, the territory was the subject of the Dishwi One Spoon, One Poon Belt Covenant, uh, an agreement between the Iroquois uh, Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. And today, uh, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this uh, territory. So without further ado, I am starting the outside salon for November the 21st. Uh, we are streaming right now, so I know that some people are uh, following us from home. I'll try to be um, clear. Uh, we are recording. Uh, okay, I have to tell you something. So I'm not first language English, and we are using an AI to record this, and then I am punching everything in. And of course, it's hilarious when I see what the AI has recorded of my voice. Anyway, <laughs> just funny. So, um, so I'll try to be clear. Um, but I hope you understand me, because you're not as stupid as the AI. Uh, so so last, for those people who were here last time, uh, we started looking at uh, how new forms of life are generated or are found or are created in the laboratory, or they are the result of some kind of weird mutations uh, from uh, uh, climate change. And sometimes they're good mutations, sometimes they're not, sometimes there's something new coming out. And we really, like, ultimately, we really don't know what will be the consequences in uh, the not too far future. And uh, um, this time, uh, we have uh, people, uh, uh, I, I called uh, people uh, tonight to, to reflect on uh, the issue of classification. So um, one of the things that I was thinking about when uh, um, uh, we look at uh, new forms of life is, so how do you classify these new forms of life? And why do we classify things? Uh, what is classification for in a time of the transformation, like uh, the Anthropocene? Uh, so, uh, and I was reminded by, uh, so I, I remember that uh, uh, essay by Borges, and actually Lawrence uh, reminded me that he's actually using uh, the uh, text by Borges, the one that talks about the Celestian Emporium of uh, Benevolent Knowledge, the one that uh, uh, gives a bunch of cl um, um, uh, classifications of uh, entities, and they look kind of very random, like the emperor, the embalmed, the trained, piglets, sirens, fabulous, stray dogs, etc., etc. And um, so the, the, these, these uh, terms seem kind of silly, but they are categories, and they describe specific items according to the place they occupy in our culture and society. So from here, I called uh, several people who have kind of uh, dealt with uh, the issue of generation and classification and like mutation in animals and organisms, the taxonomy, uh, to reflect on this. So, um, okay, so tonight we have five people, so we should go quite uh, fast. Uh, so uh, tonight we have a special guest, uh, Richard Pell, from the Center for Postnatural History <laughs> from Pittsburgh. Uh, I don't know, should I introduce you with the long uh, bio, or like you're going to introduce yourself? So he's going to talk about his work. 
Uh, then we'll have, uh, so uh, because he's coming from outside, he's going to take um, some time to talk about his work. Uh, then uh, I called some locals, Lawrence Parker, who is a melitologist, uh, Stefan Herda, who is an uh, interdisciplinary science, you're an earth science artist. Um, we have uh, Cole Swanson, uh, who is an artist and educator, uh, uh, also an interdisciplinary artist. And Anna Marie O'Brien, who is a scientist and uh, a postdoc at the University of Toronto. So, um, and each of them will give some remarks uh, about, well, I don't know, I, I gave them some really vague uh, hints. So we'll see what they say. So, Richard. All right. Oh, should I should I ask? Also, oh, in the meantime, so before before we start, and uh, Richard drinks and uh, uh, gets ready. So uh, you see that here there's uh, a few items. There's uh, two sketchbooks and uh, some Crayola. Crayola, and uh, you are very welcome to because this this is a very I think is a very generative type of discussion. So feel free to pick some of these items and to do some sketches of. Um, new forms of life, of new categories, of strange animals, strange uh, insects, uh, strange machineries. And Cole also brought some material. Do you want to explain something? Yeah, it's not really related to the talk, but it's something I've been exploring. I do a lot of work with natural pigments. And lately I've been finding fungal pigments from wood. So when wood rots, and the fungus kind of produces an iron system, it's super beautiful. And I've never, I think it's up a form of and so I, I brought in some samples, just the raw sort of wet sample, um, a dried out wood sample, um, and the separation of the pigment from the wood, so pure pigment, unbound, so not quite paint yet, but there. And then in the traditional sort of style, little oyster shell full of watercolor made from this cool stuff. So if you want, you can try it. It's kind of new. Excellent. <laughs> There's, a, there's an envelope that was going around with 3D glasses in it. If you don't have any 3D glasses yet, or if you have the envelope, wave it around or something. Um, I don't want to oversell it, uh, but they, those will become handy at some point. <clears throat> should, we, should we get, are we good? Yeah, all right. Um, Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, the Art Sci Salon, and thanks to Roberta for bringing me up, and uh, the Fields Institute for hosting, and all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Rich Pell, and I'm the director of a small museum in the city of Pittsburgh uh, called the Center for Post-Natural History, and we're going to kind of crack open what that's all about. But it has everything to do with sort of the relationship between art and culture, um, and kind of the consequences of those bumping into each other or us trying to separate them. Um, I like a good origin story, uh, and this kind of relates to, to everything. Um, in the U.S., I have no idea what the, the history of museums in Canada are, but in the U.S., there's like this, con, you know, this is zero point. There's like what we consider to be the first museum, and that's this guy's. It's Charles Wilson Peale's American Museum in Philadelphia, um, and it had... Uh, a combination of quite a lot of different sorts of things. You know, you had wild and domesticated animals, right? Think about what's in a natural history museum. It's generally exclusively the wild stuff, and we'll get more into that. We also had art, lots of painting, emerging science and technologies as well, um, and a lot of just kind of amazing stuff, all in one building. Um, and if we think about museums as organisms, the collections that they have are kind of like genetic material, right? And so they kind of, they change over time, um, and sometimes they can be uh, sort of separated out, and they, can, they can like speciate. Uh, so in the case of Peel, his kids started like kind of franchises of these museums. So chunks of his collection went here, 
went to Baltimore, went to New York. Um, and they kind of continued in the same tradition, but they're like financially struggling more and more as time goes on, trying to figure out how do you get people to pay tickets, how do you bring them in. Um, eventually, this uh, fellow named P.T. Barnum comes along, uh, the circus guy, same person, uh, and he kind of buys it all up. He's like, I know how to sell this stuff better than you. And he kind of consolidates all these collections into one building in Manhattan. Um, and it's, it's his American museum now. Um, and it's, you know, the science at this point is kind of way out the window. You know, this, we've got, we got mermaids, we've got everything happening. It's all about just getting people to uh, part with their money. Um, and then that building caught on fire and burned to the ground. So all those collections are now extinct. Um, and something happens in, in the kind of aftermath of that. Um, which is that we, we, we build new museums, you know, it's, it's sort of in the wake of this is when you get like kind of big robber baron money sort of funding museums. You get the Smithsonian's and this kind of thing. Um, but they're not the same anymore and they're not really the same ever again. Uh, we've got museums of culture over here. We have museums of nature over here and we're gonna keep those two things separate from here on out. Um, and, and that's kind of the end of that era. And it's kind of in, in like the smoke and fumes of that is also kind of the origin story of the Center for Post-Natural History. We'll get more to that. So this is, this is the front lobby of this, uh, this museum in Pittsburgh. Um, we collect uh, living things that have been altered by people uh, intentionally through breeding or domestication or genetic engineering. Uh, there's a goat there standing in front of me that uh, makes spider silk proteins in its milk um, you know, stuff like this that's just not, uh, uh, not possible through kind of traditional breeding at times. Um, and it comes down to like a pretty simple definition. Like this is the stuff that we've intentionally changed and it's, it's heritable. So it's like a, the, the cultural footprint um, within evolution. So when I talk about post-natural, I'm really saying post-natural history. I'm saying that nat natural history museums have been paying attention to a certain subset of life and ignoring this other stuff. So if natural history, arguably, just based on their exhibits, ends with kind of domestication and with when humans kind of come on the scene and start becoming a major factor, we'll just call this other stuff post-natural history. Um, <clears throat> all right, now's a good time for those glasses. And maybe we could kill the lights too. So just some, some four examples. Uh, this is one way that I try to take like the collection on the road to some extent. <clears throat> Um, so here we've got a, your traditional domesticated pug dog, right? Um, it's a descendant of wolves, right? We've domesticated these from wild wolves and then along the way we've changed them in drastic ways from the, the largest to the smallest dog is the largest size difference within a single species of animal, right? And we, we've kind of done that. That's human desire burned into the biology of these organisms. Um, and it's at like not great benefit necessarily to these animals, right? This has everything to do with what we want. You'll notice those teeth are never gonna match up together. Um, but we really like their squished faces. They're really cute. And, and those kind of oinky sounds they make when they're trying to breathe, right? Um, <laughs> I love that stuff. Um, but this is, this is old school breeding, right? This is something that happened um, Slowly, but not as slowly as you might think. This is in the last 100 to 150 years. Um, but it didn't require uh, the kinds of new technologies that we're using when we talk about genetic engineering, something that's happened during the last, say, 20 to 30 years. Um, so these are that second example. These are just the skeletons. Uh, these are mouse embryos. They're really, really tiny, about like half your thumb. Uh, and there, one has a certain gene, a certain specific Hox gene uh, turned off, and it's missing some essential parts, and the other one has that same gene kind of, I would say, turned up to 11. Uh, and it's got some extra parts as a result. So what are, we, what are we talking about here? This one has too many ribs, and you can actually see the like whiskers in there sometimes too. I don't know if, you can, if that's coming across, but they're quite remarkable um, how they're preserved. And, uh, and no ribs at all. And this is kind of something that geneticists do when they're trying to figure out what a gene does. It's like, what does this switch do? You, know, you kind of turn it on and off and see what happens. And then that gives you some clues to go with. Um, here's the carnation. 
a carnation that is blue, uh, making it's making a color that carnations can't make. It's not in their genetics. Um, but uh, a, a private company um, borrowed a gene from a, a Daphnia, another kind of flower that is blue, uh, and got it into the right place within the carnation genome so that it could be it could be blue. So that we'll buy more of them, or we'll just enjoy them more. Like this is aesthetics and commerce kind of working together. Um, here we got a, a this is like a petri dish you're looking at that has kind of a wad of spider silk that was made by that goat that we saw earlier, um, and it is remarkably strong. That's what they're looking for when they're making synthetic spider silk. Um, it's the strongest known fiber that kind of remains flexible, stronger than steel at scale. Uh, and lastly, of these 3D images, this is a gen genetically modified mosquito. Uh, this has been this particular one was engineered uh, with the idea that um, the parasite that uh, carries malaria uh, can't live inside it. It's had its gut sort of genetically altered, um, with the idea of essentially replacing mosquito one with mosquito two. Um, so unlike all the others, and unlike most of the genetically engineered organisms that we talk about, this one is designed specifically to be released into the wild. Um, captivity is not a part of it. It's to engineer the ecology in order to uh, mitigate a disease that affects humans. Right? So each one of these organisms that we just looked at kind of tells a different story about us. It's got something about our desires and fears kind of built right into it. Um, and that's what we're looking at when we look at post-natural history. We're looking at these organisms and seeing something beyond just their biology. <clears throat> so it's that kind of overlap between nature and culture, right? Um, or if we want to make this a part of like the larger conversation that's going on right now, you know, with this Anthropocene stuff, it's somewhere within like the biological component of the Anthropocene. Um, but I don't want to overemphasize it. I'm not putting a flag in the ground that like post nature, you know, nature is dead, or that post nature is a word that I want scientists to be taking on. It's it's a conversation starter. Um, it's something that uh, it's the easiest word to get into uh, talking about this stuff that I could figure out. Um, and the idea, in some respect, emerged out of like. Uh, a close reading of classification and taxonomy and phylogeny. I was reading a lot of books about evolution um, and how we were sort of refining our understanding about the evolutionary tree by looking closer and closer at the genetics um, of organisms. And at the same time, I was kind of reading a lot about genetic engineering, where we were getting better and better at finding a gene that does something in one kind of an organism and figuring out a way to port it over to another one. So I kind of became a little bit obsessed with like, how does one affect the other? You know, if we're looking at genetics in order to figure out the relationships between organisms on one hand, and then we're intentionally sort of scrambling up and shuffling the deck on the other hand, who's keeping track of that? You know, uh, how, how far into that do we go before we kind of lose sight of, of what was what to begin with? Um, so I started writing pieces of software uh, to try to keep track of this. This was a weird kind of evolutionary tree that I, I, I decided they didn't need to be so structural. Like, a, you know, biology is kind of gushy, um, so I kind of made my tree gushy. Uh, but these are all of the uh, um, model organisms. So these are uh, organisms that scientists have kind of identified as like uh, the representative of a very broad branch of the evolutionary tree, and they'll just be like kind of our arbitrarily chosen candidate right there. So you're talking about the white mouse, the fruit fly, um, you know, the zebra fish. Um, some of these are better known than others. E. coli bacteria, right? Uh, and I was trying to figure out how to like diagram that out with arrows kind of when a gene comes from one part of the tree. Basically, we're kind of like duct taping the leaves of the tree together uh, when we're genetically engineering in that way. Like, how do we represent that? How do we keep track of that? Um, and you'll see this is like spilled over and continues to exist within our logo itself. It's an evolutionary tree with these kind of arrows connecting the leaves and I kind of arguably resembles a brain kind of sliced in half if you stare at it hard enough. Um, so that's kind of the genesis of the Center for Postnatural History was this kind of close reading of taxonomy and trying to figure out um, what does it mean? 
And how do we find like useful images to help us kind of through this? Um, so one of the things that has become clear to me when I look at post-natural history uh, is it's, it's kind of completely ignored, uh, which is to say um, when I go to like the Smithsonian and I ask to see their, uh, say, Arabidopsis specimens. This is like a, um, an unremarkable weed that is used in laboratories all over the world. It's one of those model organisms, right? It exists kind of in captivity more often than not in terms of like how science looks at it. Um, if I go there and I ask for those, and, this, this, and I did, um, they're very, very disappointed. They don't understand why anyone would want to see that. Like they have got all the weird stuff, all the, the far away stuff, the stuff that's really hard to get, the stuff that's rare. Why would I want to see something that is common? Um, and there's a, a million reasons for that. On the surface, this stuff is super boring. We're talking about farm animals here, right? We're talking about pets. We're talking about fruits and vegetables that you get at the grocery store, right? It seems so common, it's not worth talking about. Um, that's one reason. Uh, I also think there's kind of an implicit like bias in this metaphor of the tree, right? Like the, the, the trunk is like the, the sturdiest part, those big branches down there. Like if you discover an organism that kind of is representative of like a new kind of branch of the tree, that's a big deal. Um, by the time you get out to the tiny little leaves, I'm, I arguably they, they seem less significant. You're in the details at this point. Um, and that's entirely the space in which post-natural history happens, right? We, we start with the leaf. We go zoom in on a microscope onto that, and we look at there's actually a tiny little tree st stemming from each tiny little species there of all of the other kind of breeds and varieties that we've created. Um, those seem like small details relative to the overall structure of the thing. Um, so what are we talking about? It's, it, there is a, a finite number of species that have uh, that it would be a part of this idea of the post-natural, right? They've got to be domesticated. Basically, everything that was ever genetically engineered was first domesticated. Um, so th this list is like, this is not a, I wrote this out off the top of my head. Um, but it's, you know, it's a good start. These are the domesticated species. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about post-natural history. Pretty familiar stuff. You know, but we usually don't see these all together. They're scattered throughout the evolutionary tree. Um, but they're all things that have had long histories with us, sometimes thousands of years, right? Um, this starts with dogs. It's kind of the first domesticated species as like a hunter-gatherer companion. Somewhere after that, agriculture. Somewhere after that, like cat, you know, rodents get into the seed and cats show up. <laughs> they become really important to us because they keep the rodents away. Um, these stories are kind of buried deep in our history. They're fascinating on their own right. Um, but if I go to the Smithsonian and I'm looking in their mice collection, um, which I got to do for like two months and it was the best two months of my life, uh, um, they've got you know tens of thousands of mice, uh, of rodents, excuse me, more larger than just mice, but rodents. Uh, and they're all you know sorted by species and place and time. Um, and yet, I go down to the end of the line to Mus musculus, right? This is the lab mouse. This is the domesticated one. It even says domesticus. Um, and it's not from anywhere. It's, it's, it's a whole, it's treated completely separately, locality unknown. It was raised in captivity. Therefore, we can know nothing about it, <laughs> right? It's like the odd stepchild of natural history. Um, and they all are, if they exist there at all, they're kind of in this kind of miscellaneous drawer. Um, and they, you know, as soon as you open the drawer, they jump right out at you, right? There's not another white mouse to be found in any of those, any of those drawers. Um, you know, mice tend to be like the color of dirt and rocks and stuff. You know? Brown, brown, basically brown. <laughs> um, but each of these has a totally different origin story. Um, it taps into like a completely different kind of evolutionary tree. There's a, one of them you, know, you can see comes from like a naval lab. Sometimes these have origins that tell us stories about um, science history, sometimes military history, sometimes commercial history. Um, and interestingly, all of those mice, if we kind of 
rewind their family tree. If we, if we take any mouse, any of those white mice in that drawer, and any mouse you find in a laboratory anywhere in the world, and we go through its family tree, its grandparents, 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 um, eventually we run into these mice. These are the ones that were captive in the 19th century. Um, and this was a hobby. Uh, you're, you're breeding mice for coat color. Um, it's entirely about aesthetics and companionship. And it's being done almost entirely by women. So here's the most common lab mouse in the world. <clears throat> the C57 Black 6, it's kind of one of the foundational mice uh, produced by Jackson Laboratories. Um, the, the BL is black. Uh, the C57, the C comes from this Dr. C.C. Little who founded Jackson Labs. That 57 connects this to this. There's like a specific moment. Every C57 mouse anywhere in the world, the most common lab mouse, um, has a common ancestor with a mouse in a pet shop run by Miss Abby Lathrop, purveyor of fancy mice, right? So Dr. C.C. Little is trying to figure out how do, how do mice work? How does coat color work? Um, you know, Mendel's papers have been re recently rediscovered. Is what's true for the pea plant true for these mice? Um, he walks into a pet shop where, like, you know, the, the legwork has been done. You know, we've got these mice that are expressing all sorts of really unnatural patterns and colors. Um, and now we can work with that. So that whole, like, kind of genetic legacy is, like, ported over from kind of one purpose and one culture um, into a completely different one. And, and this is the kind of thing that blows my mind with post-natural history. You can take something that is super boring on its surface and you rewind the clock, and it takes you into deeply powerful uh, territory where we learn kind of like about ourselves, and we learn about you know, histories that have been erased. Um, this is just another kind of lab mouse. This is another one. The, the kinds of things that we do to these organisms. Uh, this one had two traits that were super interesting to researchers, and it originated in the 1950s. And when they got both of those traits bled into the same mouse, they were really excited about it. Um, this mouse is, is obese, and it's bald. Right? Those are kind of like somewhat culturally specific concerns. I don't want to like oversell it, but like not everybody who's breeding mice is like going to like, that's, that's going to be a winner. We're going we, to we're gonna answer some fundamental questions that way. And it's, it's impo it is important. It is useful. Um, but I think it's also indicative of the culture that was in control of it at the time. Um, so here's another one from our collection. This is a more contemporary one from the same Jackson Laboratory people. They've been hard at work breeding these mice and engineering them uh, in the subsequent century. So here's an example of what taxonomy has become, right? That all the way at the left end, we've got C57 Black 6, right? And then there's all this other stuff. And if you're a student of genetics, you might recognize a few letter combinations in there, one of which is GFP. Uh, that's the green fluorescent protein that comes from jellyfish. It makes things glow. It's like everybody's first favorite thing, you know. Every first thing you want to do is make something glow, right? Um, but uh, <clears throat> that's like an unpronounceable tongue twister. And there's kind of no official designation for how we should be dealing with this kind of in a global level. Like we, we have uh, uh, you know, the concept of genus and species and lots of ways of articulating those um, concepts globally in a way that science understands. Um, but it's this kind of chaotic patchwork when you get beyond the species level into these tiny little versions. Um, and some of these genes, you might imagine, are commercial. Right? They're patented, they're owned. Um, and how is that influencing uh, our understanding of these organisms and our ability to catalog them and what they say about us? There is a cultural collision happening within the, within the genetics of these organisms that I think is fascinating. Um, it's also very telling, right? It is that culture and nature kind of overlap that we see. Um, so, you know, Jackson Labs is very invested in uh, keeping all those separate lines separate, right? Um, so 
they've got to, they, they keep track of this stuff. And they do this, they created this beautiful chart, which actually does acknowledge that at the very, very top, um, that these originally came from China, um, that in Japan they were being bred for coat color aesthetics. Um, somehow we got them over to Europe where they kind of did the same thing. And you actually see Miss Abby Lathrop is credited right there um, on the chart. Um, uh, but then this is kind of, this is, this is where we are. And this isn't just like within the whole species. This is that one C57. These are the descendants of that mouse. Um, and this is only like a fragment of that. So this is that, if we were to take that evolutionary tree before, like I said, and zoom in with a microscope on that one mouse, you know, this is the little tree that would be emerging from it, um, which kind of isn't a part of any of our conversations when we talk about natural history, when we talk about um, what all this stuff means. There's kind of a gap between the two. Uh, and it's, you know, this is a lot to keep track of. And maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe this isn't that important. Um, but I think the stories are really important. Um, and I'm not going to blow this because I know somebody else is going to be talking about it, but like no talk on taxonomy would be complete without talking about this. So I'm so psyched we're going to be able to. Um, and I will stop there. And I look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I believe Lawrence is going to, yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'm going to pass the sacred amulet to you. All right, thank you. <laughs> oh, my talk's gone. Oh, there it is. Too many to choose from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I study bees, and I was uh, happy to be in. Asked to we have the lights off. Yeah, happy to be asked to give a talk on taxonomy and classification because that is what I do. Um, which one do I press to get it go down? Oops. Okay. Yeah. So one of the questions on the flyer was: Is taxonomy necessary? It's the kind of question that makes me go apoplectic. Uh, hell, hell yes. Um, so, for example, you know, like, how can we control disease-spreading insects without knowing what they are? How can we work out the exact time somebody died unless we can identify the maggots that are growing on their body? You know, those are just two randomly chosen, creepy examples. Um, so there's the outline of my talk. Uh, I've got a lot to say, so I'm going to talk fast. Um, hopefully, I'll be moderately comprehensible. Um, so I describe new species. Here's, uh, my lab's described like 180 new bees. There's 20,500 on the official list, and we've got hundreds more just waiting for me to have the time to describe them. Here's just three of the kind of weird ones, uh, but, you know, they're spectacularly beautiful, of course. Uh, when you describe new species, you get the fun of being able to come up with names for them. So the one on the left, I think, is one of my favorite names. Caliopsis rigor mortis. This bee has a very unusual death posture because it has to force its way into these little tight flowers and the female has to go like that and so when it dies its head faces upwards. Uh, the bee on the right is Neophidelis submersa. It's called submersa because the first specimen was found drowned in a fog trap uh, and you can see both the bee and a fog trap there. Um, Okay, so I've done a lot of my work in the Atacama Desert of Chile, and one day I was driving downhill from where there is vegetation at high altitude to, where, to the absolute desert where there is no chlorophyll. 
And literally, at the last patch of flowers, I found this. Instantly, I knew that no biologist had ever seen this before, because it's in a group for which I'm the world expert, and I'm the world expert because I've got all the specimens in my office. Um, and I also immediately knew, in inverted commas, it was closely related to this one. You know, it's got the long head, it's got the long mouth parts, just like that one, which had already been described. But then when I got home, I found out I was wrong. This one has got this enormous great part of the mouth parts here, and in this one, that part is tiny. So they get these very long mouth parts for getting nectar from desert flowers, which hide their nectar at the end of long tubes, because otherwise it just dries out and turns to sugar crystals, uh, through very different methods. And so what this suggests is when you're doing your taxonomy, you have to look very carefully. You can't just use superficial characteristics. Uh, so this is part of a, an exhibit that I did uh, last year um, based on this is kind of spoof on the famous Magritte painting of a pipe. And six of these are bees and six of them aren't. So quickly work out which ones are which because I'm just about to show you the answer. Yes, yes. Who got them all right? No, no, neither do bee experts, right? I've given similar tests to the, some of the world's bee experts and they do 10% better than the beginners. Right? So even knowing what a bee is is difficult. As is shown here, this is a book on the bees of the world and that is a fly <laughs> on the cover. All right, so here we see this famous now um, Borges idea of how to classify things. Um, and I show this in all my classes because I have to teach students how to classify things. And this is a great example of how not to do it. Right, for numerous reasons. For one reason, those at a distance resemble flies. Everything looks like a fly if it's far enough away. So this isn't useful. The principle that we need to use in biology to classify things is evolution. So we reconstruct evolutionary trees, and this is how we, one of the ways we go about doing it. This is something that I did in my lab. It's the genera in this group that I've got all the world specimens of. Um, and each of those circles, or actually they're squares, uh, indicates an evolutionary change based upon a parsimony analysis of the, of the data. Um, and so of the solid circles are unique changes, the open, sorry, the solid squares are unique changes, the open squares are ones that happen more than once um, on the evolutionary tree. So that's a phylogeny based upon morphology. Here we see the kind of characteristics that we use in there, that I used in there. So, you know, the relative width to length of this sunny part on the, you know, in, on the, you know whether this part's convex or not. The genitalia are always important in insects, nearly always. It makes, you know, the fact that we spend so much time looking at them makes people think we're perverts. Um, but, you know, not only are they beautiful, but there's lots of interesting characteristics there. And then this is a part of the body that the bee uses to collect pollen. And in some species, it's bald in the middle, and in others, it isn't. So these are just some examples of the characters that I, uh, I used in constructing that phylogeny. Of course, these days, people use DNA uh, a lot, and I don't find that so interesting, but the results can be. And if you've got a DNA-based phylogeny and some fossils, you can actually do an evolutionary tree that is time calibrated. And so these are some of the geological periods. And in this particular paper, we were interested in the origin of these bees shown in red. And other than some of these red and green ones here, these are the only bees in the whole phylogeny that are found outside of North or South America. And so what this tells us is that these bees from a new world ancestry made it to the old world, and they did so somewhere around here. And interestingly enough, there are some time periods in here where the climate was a lot warmer. This is a proxy of temperature on the, on the vertical axis in that graph there. And so we actually worked out that these bees probably made it across from the, old, uh, from the New World to the Old World, somewhere around here, across a land bridge that went through Greenland, Iceland, and, and, uh, and Scandinavia. 
Okay, but one of the problems with phylogeny, you know, I'm old enough to remember when people first started doing this kind of stuff using modern methods, and the argument in grant applications was we need to do a phylogeny so we can make the classification stable. Well, the problem with that is every time somebody comes up with a new data set, the classification changes. So the exact opposite is what's happened. So here we see phylogeny for four groups of bees that are generally well known, honeybees, orchid bees, bumblebees, and stingless bees at the top. And just about every possible pattern has been supported by one or another data set. Although now things are indeed converging on pattern B there. So maybe we will have some stability, in, but you know, I can't tell the future. And there are good reasons for this. I mean, we're at the Fields Institute. Somebody's going to put an equation up there. Um, so the number of possible rooted trees depends upon the number of organisms that you're trying to put in the phylogeny. And so if you've got three taxa, there's only three possible trees, but as the number of taxa, species, if it's a species level phylogeny, increases, boy, the number of possibilities gets large quickly. So at the time we've got 65, that's larger than the number of elementary particles in the universe. How they calculate the number of elementary particles in the universe, I had no idea, and I meant to look it up on Google before I came here, but I forgot. Um, okay, so traditionally taxonomy has been done uh, on morphology, and traditionally phylogeny has been done on morphology. Now, um, molecular data is used a lot in coming up with evolutionary trees, but it's also being used to identify things. Uh, DNA barcoding was uh, invented by Paul Haber at the University of Guelph, first published in 2003. And here we get to, you know, how to identify something when there's nothing there really to identify. So, the story is, uh, 9th of May 2007, a woman in Los Angeles, or was it Chicago? In Chicago, uh, cooked some fish that she'd bought before and made soup. Uh, the fish had been labeled as monkfish. Um, and within half an hour, her husband was writhing around in agony on the floor. She was feeling pretty sick. Her daughter didn't like the soup, hardly had any, and she was fine. Uh, so they were taken to the hospital, nearly died, Morphologically, you can tell a monkfish quite easily. Uh, all sorts of characters here tell you it's a monkfish. Um, but it's pretty difficult to identify soup based upon morphology. And so what they did was to run it through the DNA barcoding machine, and they found out that it was, in fact, fugu, which is entirely poisonous unless you've had two years of training on how to cook it, which is the law in Japan where it's particularly popular, and still people occasionally <laughs> die of it. Okay, so DNA barcoding works well to identify things that are often pretty much unidentifiable. The, you know, the stuff they're doing with it these days is pretty magic. But the, these are the data I've got for the bees of Chile, color-coded by the families, heads of some of the individuals that, uh, that we've got barcoded. So each of these little lines indicates one sequence from one species. And so based upon these data, we've suggested that Chile has actually got probably at least 30% more bee species than people think, and it's actually one of the countries that's been studied in the most detail in terms of how many bees there are there. Okay, one of the things that barcoding helps us with is, it'll, um, initially everybody thought that uh, this thing here was the same as this one. They only had the one name, everything in the museum collection like we saw, you know, it was in the same drawer, actually in the same tray, uh, but the DNA barcoding told us that there was actually two things there. These bees are unusual in that the males grab hold of the female by the waist with their mandibles for a long time during mating, and as a result, the male mandibles have been selected by the females. It's, you know, if, you, if you bite me in a way I don't like, I'll refuse to mate with you, kind of story. And so the mandible is where you look for species-level differences. And as soon as we knew which individuals were in which cluster, it was easy to tell that these mandibles are really very different, and so we described a new species, and we actually named it after the father of DNA barcoding. Uh, but it doesn't always work. Uh, it doesn't always separate species. This is a, um, from a student of mine 
and uh, there's actually 17 species with a pretty much identical barcode. They're all very closely related. He can tell them apart morphologically, but the DNA barcodes are the same. I should have mentioned DNA barcode comes from mitochondrial DNA that's only inherited through the mother under usual circumstances, unless you're an oyster. Um, so, Ephialtum is actually Greek for nightmare, because these are so difficult to identify, and he discovered what he called Ephialtum, literally around the corner from where we are now. Um, one minute. Okay, I am close to the end, I think. All right, yeah, this is the last topic. Okay, so, okay, so that's, that's how we do taxonomy, kind of, in nine minutes. Um, but what we did uh, a little while ago was to see what's the status of taxonomy in the entomological literature. So we looked at 900 research articles uh, published in 2016 and worked out whether the identifications were replicable. You know, in other words, they were scientific. In other words, you could check. So to do that, you need to say, yes, we put some of the specimens here. Uh, you have to say how you did the identifications, and you have to say what concept you apply to the names that you list. That's actually a more complicated thing which I don't have time to talk about, but here are the results. Uh, less than a quarter of the papers vouched the specimens, even though people have been arguing for the need for this for decades. Uh, less than 30% of them said how the identifications were done, and almost none of them did a tax on concept, you know, less than 10%. And then when you look at the proportion that did all three, it's less than 2%. So in other words, of all the papers that used insect names published in nine journals in 2016, less than 2% of them were scientifically replicable. Oops. Um, I think my favorite story, I got a bunch of great one-liners in the paper, but one of them is, you know, like we got the organisms from the pet store and we know they're pet store because they told us, you know, so we know what they are because they told us what they were, you know, pet store taxonomy. Um, another one is, you know, like a paper said, the insects were identified by an, by an expert. You try getting a journal to accept a paper where you say the statistics were done by a statistician, P less than 0.05, and don't say anything more about it. It's really rather scandalous. Okay, so summary, taxonomy is necessary. Uh, it's fun. Uh, most biologists abuse it. Uh, classifications in biology should be based on evolution. That's also fun, but it's difficult and it can be a bit frustrating at times. And uh, if you want to see lots of lovely pictures of bees, the Instagram account uh, or the website, and you'll find pictures of hundreds and hundreds of lovely bees and no ugly ones because that's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is it you next? Is, is this next? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You know, I do well, I'm going to screw this up. I'm hopeless at this kind of stuff. We'll figure it out together. Oh, yeah. That's it. Perfect. Yay. I'm helpful. You got this it. It doesn't happen often. Oh, I know. It's so and how do we do? How do we do? Uh, uh, is this um, full screen? Uh, mm, view. Full screen. Ha ha. Yes. Perfect. Hey. All right. So, uh, good evening, everybody. And, uh, Thank you for having me part of such an interesting conversation. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if we need to hit the lights or necessarily if you guys can see it. Oh, it's, that's good. Um, um, my name is Stefan Herda, and I'm a practicing visual artist, a homebrew alchemist, amateur rock hound, and forager, currently pursuing a degree in landscape architecture at U of T here. Um, I had the lovely opportunity of working with the Art Science Salon in 2017 with Roberta and Steven in the Cabinet Project, and I'm happy to share with you some of the stuff I'm experimenting with today um, and recently. Uh, so my work sits in an intersection between art and the interpretation of the earth sciences and chemistry, um, exploring our troubled relationship to nature, 
and questioning how we might continue to impact the Earth through history long after we're gone. Uh, this recent example of the, from the Found Geode series shows here, shown here represents a new hybridized form, a potential outcome, emblematic of the continued mutation and evolution of industry, natural processes, and the compression of time. Um, my interest in geology started at a very young age. <laughs> here I was 20 years ago in Bancroft, hunting for the elusive Herkimer diamond. Uh, look how disappointed I was when I found out that Herkimer diamonds were primarily found south of the border in New York State and weren't actually diamonds after all, but doubly terminated quartz crystals. So, uh, When I attended the University of Guelph back in 2010, I started exploring with alternative methods and materials for art making, focusing on natural dyes and homemade ink making. I modified textile recipes to produce unlikely results on paper, and here's an example of the terribly invasive buckthorn berry, the original pigment for sap green still found in art stores. Um, the anthocyanin pro uh, properties within the dye shift color when you adjust the pH level. And so really this is just one color modified by a variety of at-hand chemicals, vinegar, baking soda, a bit of red wine. Um, and this kind of started transforming after a while. I started using mordants and metal salts to fix and alter the color, which is an essential uh, uh, part of the uh, dye making process. And I noticed crystallization began to appear r random on the substrates when um, the concentrations of the salts would drop out of solution. And this small moment sent me along the current path I now explore, mimicking mineral formations with wood and unlikely substrates. And in the last few, few years, this investigation and the questions and implications it's raised continue to change in scope and complexity, uh, inviting new directions and methods for working with and against this uh, time-based and unpredictable method. Um, and uh, here, uh, that was the first prototype geode, and that was done with Zepp Rudaway, a root killer substance. So this here is the, uh, I guess, the evolved form of this. This is coil, a most recent exploration of copper sulfate inside a cedar root matrix. And this work is roughly the size of a human torso. So the work is getting bigger and bigger, and it took about over the course of an entire winter to develop, develop this, uh, this work. And I'm not the first artist to incorporate crystal growth, homebrew chemistry, and an interest in the crystalline. So this is a very... Um, a vast and terrifying work by Roger Hjorns out of England. Uh, one very famous example, an entire apartment was sealed and transformed uh, into a crystal cave using copper sulfate. And um, visitors were allowed to explore and walk through the space. Um, and I still wonder to this day how this project was allowed based on safety concerns. Uh, as, and then patrons would often steal, uh, you know, crystals from the exhibition and pocket it and put it bring it home, not knowing that they were holding something incredibly dangerous. Um, and I've been always taken by the work of Robert Smithson as well. Of course, this is famous spiral jetty um, and uh, the nature of the crystalline and tropic processes and geology were cornerstones of his practice. Um, Marina Abramovic recently is starting to play with crystals, and this is one of her salt busts with a quartz crystal on her forehead. And um, my good uh, David Altmedged as well from, oops, Yep, David Alledged from Canada as well. Um, you know, he's got these really amazing transformative sculptural works dealing with crystals. And um, this is my good friend Tyler Thrasher uh, from Oklahoma, who, in his words, just crystallizes dead things. <laughs> and so he kind of works at that intersection between chemistry and, um, and whatnot and geology. Uh, and of course, Elaine Whitaker, a good friend here, um, uh, we've got Elaine, uh, who explores intersections of biology and contemporary art practice using the language of salt formations and petri dishes as one of her many visual cues, exploring pandemics, disease, and our relationship to those unseen processes in our changing world. Um, and there are still many more of us that explore crystal growth and what it means to incorporate natural processes. Like, um, And where does this take us now, and what are some of the real-world parallels happening all around us? Um, here's some other work that I've done here, more examples of the geode series. And um, so, you know, again, what does this all mean? Are these works just process experiments to satisfy a childhood curiosity, or is there something more sinister and perhaps more exciting at play? Um, I'm just going to see if I can pull up this video here to show you. Um, because in 2017, I was part of uh, a group show at Inner Access where I showed some time based work exploring some of these processes. So I'll just loop this here now. We can hopefully it loads, and there we go. Perfect. Um, yeah, so 
Uh, in 2017, I was part of a group show at InterAccess called Cultivars Possible Worlds. It was a group exhibition for subtle technologies, uh, exploring the cultivation of unlikely materials and hybrid methodologies. And to quote the curator, the exhibition uh, was exploring technologies of representation and reproduction that are intrinsic intrinsically linked. The same instinct that motivates the human animal to tame nature through biotechnology is the same one that compels it to represent it, it, its reality through art. And uh, at the time, I was interested at, in translating these invisible processes of crystal accum uh, accumulation. So I created simulated lab conditions to document these life and death cycles. Um, there it is. It's still going. Perfect. It's kind of hard from here. I'm like, is the video frozen or is it actually working? OK, good. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a fertilizer, a sweetener, a preservative, and a dye mordant. And it basically runs on loop. So I think we've seen enough of this kind of contemplative video. And, all right. So um, and this is another work that was included in the exhibition as well. Um, this was uh, uh, basically this weird giraffe looking form is a bit of charcoal, uh, salt, laundry bluing, and the salt crystals would accumulate and grow over the course of the exhibition. Um, so, I mean, in terms of taxonomy and organizational principles, I mean, there are, you know, how are these systems going to change? And in terms of, is it, is it, is it, it's unlikely like um, this, you know, discovering or classifying a new color, is it much like discovering a new species where we catalog document and introduce a new discovery? Um, and if, right now, you know, we've got, um, you know, look at a few of these minerals, they look pretty beautiful, but these are eight examples of more than 208 or six examples rather of more than 208 new anthropogenic mineral specimens cataloged and documented. And 4% of the known mineral species are actually created due to human mediated uh, interventions. So I was looking at some work and uh, uh, writings by Robert Hazen, who works at the Carnegie Institute. Um, and he contends that we've irreparably modified, displaced, and mutated the earth through mining material, the displacement, and the production of industrial new materials uh, like con concrete, glass, et cetera, and to uh, provide further evidence of uh, the Anthropocene. So these are two other examples. This uh, top crystal here, calcocyte, was uh, formed between the reaction of uh, acetic acid and museological specimens found in oak cabinetry. And Simon Colite is a, a mineral kind of uh, waste deposit from mining. Um, Hazen and his team also question the implications of classifying these new materials. Hazen states that the International Mineral Mineralogical Association did not consider uh, a more ambiguous category of mineral-like compounds that include what might be termed human-mediated uh, minerals, crystalline compounds that form indirectly by natural, physical, chemical, and biological processes, only as an inadvertent co consequence of human modifications of the environment. And given the increased recognition of an interest in human influences on Earth's near-surface environment, Hazen contended that a comprehensive understanding and analysis of the mineralogical structure and uh, nature of the Anthropocene uh, was warranted. And here's an example, of course, of how synthetic crystals uh, are, can be grown, and could, this could possibly result in future uh, minerals as well. Um, the IMA, in response, stated that uh, uh, these are some examples of the cataloging of work that Hazen had produced. I don't know if you can really see that or if it's showing up. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty small. Whoops. We're going to go right to the class of gomerates then, I guess. But yeah. Um, so. Uh, Kelly Jazvak, Patricia Corcoran, and Western University researchers found these specimens at Camilo Beach in Hawaii. Uh, these are new geological indicators that are formed when plastic and trash melts and fuses together uh, with natural materials such as basaltic lava fra fragments, sand, shells, wood, and coral, resulting in a plastic rock hybrid. Again, these are more examples of uh, human-mediated geology that will likely to continue to accumulate and diversify as time goes on. Uh, and building upon the uh, discoveries of the plastic glomerate as a precedent, uh, Shahar Levine explored potential use value of post-plastics with her uh, lithoplast material. Um, she sees lithoplast not as a viable material for use, but just remaining in the, the realm of speculative design. Um, and so uh, here's some <laughs> uh, picture of me creating one of my larger creations. And, a little bit of a counterpoint. I always kind of think back to this concept of alchemical transmutation and turning lead to gold and per, uh, perpetuating some of the tropes of the mad scientist. And, um, you know, how might materials we take for granted transform when we're gone? I'm 
thinking about what new relationships become established and what happens to overlooked household items or the implications of their appropriate disposal even. Um, in regards to some of my later work, here I'm working with bismuth. Um, it's heavier than lead, non-toxic, and a key ingredient in Pepto-Bismol. And uh, using elemental materials is both a practical exploration of finding more stables and uh, stable materials and methods because working with you know, homegrown crystals uh, obviously comes with some of its difficulties and working with something a little bit more uh, uh, robust and heavy here like bismuth is uh, uh, a new avenue for exploration here. Um, these are piezoelectric Rochelle salts. Um, these crystals uh, generate energy when pressure is applied to them. Um, and some of the more recent works here are these hybrid forms using electrolysis. So I'm growing uh, copper crystals, pure copper crystals using a copper sulfate bath. And these, of course, take time over an entire month. I realize now that this is not full screen this entire time. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that's better. Ah, oh, nice. There we go. Here, we'll, we'll go back and see. Well, we'll see this here. So, um, uh, the contrast between wood and uh, detritus and metal uh, is as much a nod to wood carving and craft making as it is a kind of a stand in for the idea of the natural. So, after kind of experimenting with these uh, copper forms, I started putting them and integrating them inside some of like the the language of working with uh, woodworking and wood turning as I had done in the past. Um, and here's another example. Uh, the One of the latest things I've been working on here, this took almost three months to grow. It started creating mold and other algae, weird kind of things that I didn't really expect to grow inside a copper sulfate solution bath. You can see, see the, that green, like kind of mold growing at the bottom there. So I'm kind of working with, uh, again, compounding these crystalline shapes and forms and elemental materials inside wood matrices. So um, here's another one here, uh, again, with a, a turned uh, maple bowl and fertilizer chemicals. So it's taken a few years, but as time goes on, the, the crystalline forms are starting to get a little bit more and more detailed. Um, and I'll end with this right here. This detritus, this latest work that I'm doing, it's composed, it's comprised of uh, eroded granite and fertilizer reincorporated from another project. So I'm starting to recycle a lot of the materials that I'm using. Um, and reflecting on my current pursuit within landscape design now, this piece kind of is a nod to uh, an issue surrounding our local geology. Um, what I found fascinating in this case is that this is from the Leslie Spit, this uh, bit of granite. And this Leslie Spit is essentially a material dump site transformed into a park that contributes to the erosion of the Toronto Island by blocking sediment uh, from the Scarborough Bluffs. And um, just working in this way, I'm trying to find that and bridge that connection between my current pursuits uh, and what I was working on before. And I realized what just how you know all these natural systems are interconnected, especially at the local level, and how easily they can be disrupted through industrial processes and de development, which will continue to influence uh, my perspectives and experiments as I keep moving forward. Yeah. Cool. Can you put the back on or off? Uh, okay. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that's like a little like connection there. Yeah, that's a little connection there. Does everybody know uh, what that is? Mm -hmm. no, okay, so, um, can somebody explain to him? Oh, I will. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's part of the process. <laughs> this is my talk. <laughs> Here you are, sir. There you go. It's, it's so many things. Am I, am I uh, working now? Do you see me? Oh, one sec. Of course, I'm the difficult one that has to bring his own computer. Um, you can or you can't? OK, let's try this one more time. It's registering something on my end. 
Do we know? It's just a HDMI cable, right? Also. Let's try the other. This is my favorite part of teaching. <laughs> Happens. Yeah, one thing so no, no, no. No? No. I haven't tried it on the system. Oh, right. I mean, it's saying it's registering, but. <laughs> So How many professors does it take? Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can lose the lights if you want. Nobody has to see me. Ah, uh, no, that's perfect. So Leslie Spit. Um, great introduction. Um, my name's Cole Swanson. I'm a contemporary artist. Um, I guess the short version of my story was I was a zoology major at Guelph, and I dropped out of that after a year because the math. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I always wanted to be an artist, so back at that time it wasn't really the case that you could sort of do both. Um, so I pursued my four-year undergrad in art, and moved to India and studied miniature painting, and I spent a lot of time working with natural materials. Uh, fast forward like 15 years, and I'm working with animals again. So I sort of ended up doing what I always wanted to do. I'm calling this uh, presentation Devil's Colony because it's a bit of a case study on just one, one sort of body of work. Um, otherwise, I could talk for three hours. Uh, so maybe you know what cormorants are. Um, a lot of people in Toronto do. Double-crested cormorants have made the news a lot in the last uh, few years, especially in the last year because um, their populations have risen quite dramatically since they were almost entirely eradicated through exposure to chemicals like DDT in the 1960s. And even before that, their populations actually went down because people did not like them. They thought they were harbingers of evil. So like a lot of other birds that were black, they were decimated. So their populations have sort of risen and fallen over the years. They're an indigenous species that's been under the uh, sites of the provincial government, the Ford government has proposed a cull on these birds, um, 50 birds per day for a member of the public to shoot. So that's 14,000 birds a year for every individual with no concession for spoilage, which basically means that you can shoot the bird and leave it and not really do anything with it. This is an exception to the Fish and Wildlife Act. So it's a pretty exceptional situation that we're in right now. And the proposals on the books. So we're kind of watching intently. Um, of course, conservationists and scientists and animal rights activists are keen to fight a battle against this. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the double crested cormorant has been um, reviled for centuries in Western culture. And I think that's kind of how I'm going to tie to this broader conversation about taxonomy, not just scientifically but just in more broadly systems of classification and the impacts that they have on the natural world. Cormorants are an ancient, ancient bird. They're like the dinosaurs of the bird world and they've had a long time to adapt amazing behaviors. So they're great flyers, they can dive for long periods of time, they're great fishers, they're tree perchers, they're sort of like super birds. And it's for that reason that they represent a real challenge to mainstream culture here um, in the modern world. They sort of are um, thought of as being these uh, terrible things that take over our green spaces. Um, their guano is highly acidic, so whenever they colonize, they kill the trees. Um, and fisher people believe that they're eating all the commercially viable fish. So there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding or misinformation going around about cormorants. Well, cormorants have been taxonomized uh, officially in the 1800s. Um, they're a North American cormorant, um, so they're a New World cormorant. They exist here, um, and they are an indigenous species. They're not an invasive species, as many people would believe. They've also been classified, though, apart from science, as, uh, as sort of a, one of the unclean birds that goes back to the Bible. So I started to think about taxonomies that are much older than modern scientific taxonomies. So there are unclean animals in the Bible, and there, there are many points in the Bible that sort of cite cormorants as being these gluttonous things, um, dirty, black, 
dark, evil, filthy, all of the human characteristics that Western Christianity doesn't value. And that's something that I think we need to take seriously because if people have been believing these truths about cormorants for thousands of years, then it might explain the real world effects on their population and their continued um, relationship with us now in the present. They also have a really interesting um, classification. Cormorants have been sort of subclassified right now with the government's proposal. So basically the government is saying, you know, you can go out in a boat and you can shoot into a colony and the colonies are really significant. They're, they can they can have tens of thousands of nests. Um, but if you're within city limits, you can't. So right now there's like sort of a further classification. There's like country cormorants and city cormorants. And if you're lucky enough to be a city cormorant, you'll evade death. But of course in the natural world, those lines are very blurred city cormorants fly to the country to fish. So it's just interesting to think of the cultural structures that we put in place in order to imagine how we might control or interact with these animals. The first time I ever experienced cormorants, um, aside from this sort of stray bird here and there, was when I went to Leslie Spit, Tommy Thompson Park. Um, and we are very lucky in Toronto to have the largest double-crested cormorant calling in the world. At the peak of its breeding season, we have about 70,000 individual birds, so that's parents and chicks, spread across really just two, two and a half kind of peninsulas of land, really small areas of land. So when we're talking about tree coverage destruction, we're talking about actually a really limited amount of tree coverage. And um, to Stefan's point, Leslie Spit is sort of like a bit of an ecological mistake. It was a backfill sort of dumping ground over the course of decades that ended up springing all this growth and becoming a really important ecological space. So now we don't want them to kill the trees, even though the trees weren't there in the first place. So if you start to think about it, the colony site itself is a really fertile ground for thinking about things like taxonomies and classification, because it actually confounds a lot of the really clean lines that we like to draw in the sand when it comes to nature. Things like what is natural versus what is artificial, what is indigenous versus what is invasive, what is human, what is animal. This is just a small portion of the colony that I photographed from inside the scientific observation fly. So you get a sense of just how vast the colony is. I was reminded of one of the texts I read long, a long time ago when I started to first kind of get into this field of like human animal or human non-human systems um, by Ron Brolio. He talked about um, in his book, Surface Encounters, thinking with animals in art, that art um, and maybe even philosophy has the ability to bring us somewhat closer to understanding the world of an animal other or really any other. You'll never actually quite get there, but by thinking really creatively, we may approach a closer sort of relationship, a more uh, empathetic understanding of this other. And, it, and art is wonderful because it kind of breaks a lot of rules, right? It doesn't, forgive me scientists, but it doesn't necessarily have to stick to all of the same structures and systems that science has to. And it's one of the reasons why I'm an artist. Um, so I considered that if I was going to work with cormorants, I had, to, I had to get as far away from the mainstream conversation that was happening, that basically they're just dirty and their shit kills everything and they eat all the fish. Um, so I was lucky enough to collaborate with uh, Dr. Gail Fraser from York University. She is a waterbird specialist and she's been working with the Leslie Spit colony for a long time. Um, and with her and the permissions of the TRCA, which you always need to get, um, I got uh, a chance to, to explore the colony site. And I had always heard that cormorants were really interesting because they gathered garbage and they kind of put garbage into their nests. And that didn't really seem that important because Leslie Spit is basically just a giant pile of garbage. But um, when I went there, it was like, maybe it was the artist eyes or the color theory teacher in me, but I was like, oh my God, they're all collecting mostly blue and yellow garbage. And that just like jumped out at me. And I remember talking with people who've been working on the site for years and I was saying like, do you see this? Do you see this? And everybody was like, well, maybe, I don't know. So I started to form a little bit of a hypothesis that double crested cormorants, unlike the other birds that live adjacent, so gulls and night herons and egrets, they're collecting these anthropogenic materials and they're doing it with a certain agency of color selection. 
So I started to create a photo archive of about a thousand nests and uh, I printed a selection in a recent exhibition. And you can see just in the sample of the archive that it does appear that cormorants like cerulean blue and primary yellow. Why, who cares, right? N I, I mean, I do because, <laughs> obviously I do. Because as soon as I sort of stumbled on this, this possibility, it's not a fact yet, but this possibility, it started to tell me, uh, it started to bring up a lot of re really interesting questions. Like questions like, what kind of waste do we produce and what makes its way into nature? You know, is the color situation happening because we just produce a lot of blue and yellow garbage? I started to think about, you know, what might that be? IKEA bags, tarps, safety materials. But then we started to look at the spit and we realized that the spit isn't just covered in blue and yellow garbage, it's covered in everything. And that cormorants are actually not collecting materials exclusively from the spit. A lot of what's in their nests is not from the spit. So they're actually traveling out to very actively select these objects. My theory is this. <laughs> cormorants, double-crested cormorants, have really beautiful cerulean blue interior of their beaks. Their eyes are this gorgeous green blue color. They have this bejeweled ring around their eyes and they have bright yellow orange cheeks. So maybe this is an evolutionary trait. Like maybe when cormorants are breeding, they are showing off these colors to one another and then they sort of happen upon these colors in nature. Maybe they've adopted this kind of practice. I sort of think this is really interesting because if you think about it, in the 60s, they basically disappeared, right? So up until that point, they would have had almost no access to these materials or colors whatsoever. Then they come back within the last 20 years, and they live in this, you know, the Anthropocene, this sort of garbage paradise. Um, and they have their pick of whatever it is they want, but they're now possibly extending some of those longer adaptable behaviors into their material selection. And it just seems like really, really interesting for a number of reasons. I started like thinking about the site. Leslie Spit itself as being particularly special. One minute. Oh, wow. Leslie, oh, that happened fast. Leslie Spit is particularly special because it's the coalescence of all of these different classification systems kind of mashing up against each other. You know, in the spirit of Donna Haraway, I was thinking about how the spit itself embodies, you know, these, these dualities or these differences about urbanity, about the rural space, about green space versus human-made space, about animal versus human. Um, so I made this performance piece where I collected materials like a cormorant would collect materials, and I created this character called Spit Spectre. It's a bit of a meditation on the space itself. When the birds leave in the fall, they leave back behind this material trace that every year builds up, just get the nest get taller and taller and taller, and the material gets embedded in it. Um, so you can see it, actually, in the photograph. Spit Spectre is a performance where the character walks an endless loop over and over and over again through the peninsula. So Gail and I are continuing to do some research. The next phase of the project is to actually examine whether or not the birds at Leslie Spit are actually very specifically engaging with our material urban presence. That maybe this is something that's unique to happening in this environment. And so we've been collecting, this is our next step and I promise this is the end. We're collecting waste from the nests. We're going to recolor them according to like a broader color code redeploy them and see what they do and capture them on footage. And the idea is that perhaps we can build something that is, you know, and it's some kind of aesthetic output um, in the form of an artwork or film or process work, but also publish something that kind of points us in the direction of better understanding this animal, which we've often reviled. Uh, so stay tuned. What's that? Why didn't they get mad at you? The birds? They were changing all the colors. They haven't, they don't know yet, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're in Florida right now, it's okay. <laughs> when they come back, they're gonna go like, damn, they changed colors. <laughs> well, we'll see, we're gonna hide little cameras everywhere. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Let's go back in this computer. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, 
I'm Anna, um, and I am in a postdoc uh, here on campus. I'm a biologist and evolutionary ecologist. Yeah, sure. Off or? Um, off, I guess. Um, I have a little of my city organism in a jar that I was going to pass around. Um, you can. Or I can just let it free and the light can come on at some point and people can actually see what's in the jar. I have pictures of it though. Um, yeah. Um, so my study organism in the jar is not this, um, but I'm starting with a picture of this plant. Um, for uh, It's a little bit more photogenic on the big screen, um, so it's larger. I'm interested in variation that occurs within species um, and how that variation might be interacting with um, things that changes we're making to the environment. Um, so this plant is interesting. Um, because it has a lot of within species variation that we care about. Um, we've broken it down and classified it into sort of seven major groups, and those are based on traits. Um, and those major groups are things that we eat. So this is a Brassica oreca, which has been domesticated and is cauliflower and kale and kohlrabi um, and cabbage and Brussels sprouts, and the list goes on. Um, and I, um, I work on traits that are a little bit less um, categorical than that, right? So we can see those nice bins um, that we created, but I'm interested in things that are a little bit more flexible, so like height of a plant or size of a plant or when the plant does something, like flowering. Um, and so those we call sort of quantitative traits and non-categorical traits. Um, and this is some, some old work on why uh, individuals from within a species, from within a, a category, why they will look different. Um, so these people took um, sticky, sink foil, sink, sticky sink foil and moved it from three different places in California, um, put them down, put the same three ones down at every single site, um, and that's what you're looking at um, in one column there. That's the three different um, collected sink foils, um, and then across the row is the three different sites. So you see differences in traits um, in both directions. So when you go across a different site, um, there you're talking about um, plastic differences. So you've put the exact same genetic material down in a different condition, and it develops differently. Um, and then when you go um, across the different origins, oh, they both say test site. <laughs> That's confusing. And when you go across the different origins, um, then you, what you're looking at are um, differences that are sort of encoded into the piece of material you've moved around, um, the genetic differences. Um, and we know that those differences um, have come to arise because there's variation um, in organisms themselves um, at the DNA level. Some of this impacts their traits. Um, those traits might impact how well they do at different sites. So you'll see that some of those fail to survive at the highest elevation site. So um, DNA variants that underlie the traits that cause them to fail to survive, namely they're a little bit, um, their vegetation is a bit too high off the ground and it freezes and they die. Um, those traits um, were removed from that high elevation population. And so then you get different populations that look differently. Um, and what's happening here is probably um, something about temperature and precipitation as the driving force for changes between those different populations within the species. Um, sort of the take home there. Um, I'm interested in how anthropogenic works and anthropogenic contaminants work as a driving force. Um, and you know, mostly how what are the differences we might see um, from gradients that existed before anthropogenic contaminants? Uh, I work on duckweed, which is in both of those photographs there, but it's hard to see. It's a little green schmear um, on there. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Duckweed is lemna minor. It's a floating aquatic plant. Um, so I've zoomed in so that it's bigger than a green schmear. Um, and there's that little drawing there of what one um, individual might look like. Um, it's mostly clonal. So if I pick up two of those plants, they're um, probably genetically 100% identical. Um, and um, floating and aquatic, and it lives all around Toronto and outside of Toronto, um, and basically across North America. 
Uh, it also associates with microbes, and we've known this for a really long time. I like to put up <laughs> the how long we've known this um, slide. So um, some of the first microscopes were identifying the little things that live on a duckweed. Um, and these microbes, if you take them away from the duckweed and don't give them back and compare duckweed there, you've taken them away, and duckweed where you've taken them away and given them back, um, they grow better with the microbes than without. Um, and here when I say microbes, that is a mix of a bunch of different things from across the tree of life. So bacteria, fungi, and diatoms. Um, I, we do these little experiments with them. They're very nice for experiments because they're tiny and because you can manipulate the microbes. So I stick them in a plastic well plate um, and I take a picture of them at the beginning and a picture of them after they've had some time to grow. Um, so that's what, uh, then they'll the sort of end, they'll look a little bit different from each other even if they start all the same. Um, so in terms of anthropogenic stressors that they might be thinking about, basically everything you ever interact with on a daily basis, that gets into the water. Um, so something you wear, something you eat, um, pharmaceuticals, um, particles come off of everything all the time. They end up in the, in the side of the street there. Those are some big particles that you're looking at, but I also think about really tiny particles. So tire dust that comes off of um, car tires as they drive on the road, um, and then things that maybe leach out of those larger items, so um, chemicals that come out of them. And I just want to show you um, right here, I think it's on the next slide, um, some results of what happens when you give those anthropogenic contaminants to duckweed. Um, so benzotriazole is maybe a, a, a word we don't think about that much. Um, that's a chemical that's involved in de-icers where you don't want the metal you're putting the de-icer on to rust. So, um, so a de-icer you might put in a car, on an airplane. Um, it also goes into dishwashing fluid. Um, and it has a lot of potentially negative effects on organisms. It's potentially um, recalcitrant in the environment. Um, and when I say negative effects on organisms, also humans, but um, at a dose higher than you're likely to receive. So I'm not trying to encourage panic. <laughs> um, so that same picture I showed you before was sort of a cobbled together um, of the different wells where we expose the duckweed to the different things. Um, so I expose them to simultaneous application of the de-icer agent, benzotriazole, so that's the anti-corrosive agent in the de-icer, and salt. And these two things are applied at the same time in winter, so um, you can think about them as interesting instead of independent effects and, and dependent effects. Um, and as before, those different rows represent different uh, genetic things, so different origins of duckweed. So it's one of those um, one of them comes from uh, sort of the lake edge out east, um, one of them comes from the, a scientific reserve, and one of them comes from a little stormwater pond at the side of the Don Valley Parkway. Um, and they respond to those different treatments, um, both plastically, so the same genotype doesn't grow to be the same size or the same color of green um, in these different treatments. And um, there's also differences among the three sites um, in terms of genetic differences. And then the other level that I've added there is I've taken away their microbes and put them back um, here. So sometimes the plant genotype is changing and sometimes the plant and the microbial community from the site that it came from is also changing. Um, and so I don't think I put up, um, no, I didn't put up any discussion of results. Um, but I think interesting, so I, I always like to think about the results, but what What's interesting if you, so that's three, because um, I like to show the picture of the duckweed fronds, um, but we've done this for about 50 collections of duckweeds and their micro associated microbial communities. And duckweed from um, closer to Toronto will tolerate um, higher levels of benzotriazole, and, um, but duckweed from further out won't. Um, the other thing that is interesting is that if that's only when you don't give them the microbes. When you give them the microbes, they all grow the same. And when you give them the microbes, um, more of the benzotriazole disappears from the experiment. So it's actually constantly disappearing in the experiment, and it's not um, what's left over at the end is not what I put in at the beginning, and that's because the plant and the microbe are breaking it down. Um, yes, there was another point. 
want to think. Oh, so the other point I want to make is something that came up earlier is I, I work with these communities of microbes and I identify them in DNA barcoding, right? Um, and this is a, an identification that tells me what the sequence of one particular gene is um, that they have. What this doesn't really tell me um, is exactly who is there or what they do. Um, one of the reasons that I uh, just sort of, as an ecologist, angle of it, I'll throw up my hands and say I don't need to know all of that is because if I looked at another gene, I'd get a different answer as who was there. Um, and that's because one, there are, um, those, those microbes are constantly um, picking up bits of DNA from the environment. Um, their population sizes are huge. So if a, if a beneficial mutation originates over here, um, Population sites are huge and they have generations really quickly. So if there's a beneficial mutation in one gene, it could sweep rapidly and it could end up in another species. Um, and then the other reason that's interesting here um, is because those microbes seem to be providing, sort of wiping away some of the categories and providing a lot of the um, ability of this organism to tolerate something new that we've thrown into the environment. So even though benzotriazole is new, um, the microbes can handle it. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, and then the idea that it kind of looks like from, from this point of view, the microbes and the plants are responding to this as though it was any other stressor. Um, there's some amount of just sort of adaptation to tolerate, much in the way that there is adaptation to tolerate a change in temperature or precipitation. Yes. 